It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this brand new spur of the moment <laughs> exclusive live edition of the Remnant Report. Tonight, we are going to be doing things a little bit differently. It's just going to be me on here with you guys live, and I'm actually going to be playing two videos. One, the first one in my opinion, has gotten enough play. It's from Pastor Joe Schimmel from Good Fight Ministries calling men like me uh, heretics, among other things. So I'm going to play that and give some commentary to a little bit of it. Just enough to keep from getting flagged for copyright. And then the real fun begins because... Pastor Christopher Chapman from Kingdom Theology and I put together a video for you guys that not only shows the original and correct systematic theology, but also absolutely debunks dispensationalism and this lie that they have created called replacement theology. There would be no replacement theology if it wasn't for dispensationalism, which you will find out as you are watching. So, I am going to go ahead and put the video on, and we are going to see what Pastor Schimmel has to say, and then we're going to hear what Pastor Chapman and I have to say, and we're going to see which one of us is Telling the truth, because out of the three of us, and out of the two videos, um, there's only one video that actually uses the Bible. And I'll let you see for yourself which one it is. Well, without any further ado, here we go. Praise God, I'm sure, unless you've been, you know, asleep for a day straight, uh, you've heard that Israel, Iran, who'd been singled out as running a proxy war against Israel through Hezbollah, uh, through Hamas, and so forth, and helping coordinate what happened on October 7th, when hundreds of people were slaughtered. Uh, uh, you'd heard the news then, perhaps, I've talked about it a bit, that, that Iran was pulling the strings. Iran is a world power. Iran is an ally who's helped Russia make formidable strides within Ukraine by sending them all sorts of, not only working with them at a military level, but uh, also sending them drones and so forth. And then yesterday, uh, the news came out, first time this ever happened, because Iran isn't next to Israel like so many other Muslims nation, Muslim nations, but they sent hundreds of uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, drones to Israel. Uh, thankfully, I mean, they're one of our allies, and thankfully uh, we had moved fleets of ships there in case this escalates to world war, because keep in mind, Iran's allies are China and Russia, the greatest world powers on the planet, besides the United States, and they are opposed to us. They are dictatorships, as you know. Uh, and uh, they were worried about this escalating and potentially still into kind of a world type, world three type scenario. Have you heard me talk about Iran and being an end time player in the messages we talked about over and over and over again? And it's it's prophetic. I've warned you that this is not an accident. And I want to do a message because I think this is such a needed message right now. I was going to do part two of repentance. 
but I'll do that another time because I wanted to talk about Israel and the heresy of replacement theology. Okay, so Pastor Joe Schimmel was going to do a sermon on repentance. That was what his sermon Sunday evening was supposed to be about. I'm assuming it was evening. But instead, I'm supposed to believe that the Holy Spirit led him to change his sermon from being on repentance to being about uh, Rothschild-created Zionist Israel and the heresy of replacement theology. That the church is now Israel and that we have now received the promises of God from the Old Testament and they don't apply to the Jews at all. They receive the curses, but the church receives the promises and we fulfill the promises of Israel uh, now and in the millennial kingdom, but God's all done with the Jewish people as a people. It's all done with Israel. That is rank heresy. That is so contrary to the teaching of Scripture. It's called supersessionism as well, that the church has superseded Israel. Certainly, the prophecies in the Old Testament and bring the Gentile believers into the fold. Amen? And Gentile believers, like wild olive branches, have been grafted into the olive tree, which is Israel. Amen? Israel doesn't cease to be a people, and the church doesn't replace Israel in God's plan, as we'll see today. Well, we're going to hear what he has to say, because there's nothing from the Bible. I'll go ahead and give you a spoiler there. Um, we're going to hear what he has to say about replacement theology and the heresy of it. And then... I'll give you the facts, and I'll actually use Scripture. All right, I'll be quiet now. What is replacement theology? Taken to its extremes, it means that God is all done with the Jews. He's done with Israel. Israel isn't a nation before him as a, a people that are in his plan anymore. What happened in, on May 14th, 1948 is just a strange coincidence, you know, uh, uh, really strange coincidence for them. I, mean, I don't know how they live with these understandings when they see what the scriptures say. You see the fulfillment of prophecy. But the scripture says nothing about 1948. They literally have to almost break the arm of the word of God to make it fit into dispensational prophecy, much less actual biblical prophecy. But no, sir, none of us believe that 1948 Israel was a coincidence. I know full well who was behind it, and there was no coincidence to it. It was a part of a plan. It just had nothing to do with biblical prophecy, unless you count the fact that it is another sign of our Lord's soon return. This is all very, very serious because bad theology leads to wrong living leads to wrong decisions. In fact, the, the Holocaust and many of the ways in which the Jews were treated in the past uh, was based on understandings and teachings that the, the Jewish people, God's done with them. We could just eradicate them from the earth. You mean like Hitler being the first one to send the Zionists over to Palestine? Or do you mean like how the largest group of believers anywhere in the underground church or in the underground church in Palestine that you never mention once. And I'm not just talking about this video. I mean, I have not heard you mention the underground church in Palestine, your brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters who are being killed because they refuse to renounce the gospel. And they're not just being killed by Muslims. They're being killed by Jews, Muslims, and everyone in between who hates the followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, there's just some really interesting parallels. And I'm not going to get all into Islam uh, today. I want to get into replacement theology a little bit and, and talk about God's plan and place for Israel in the end of days and how you really can't understand the end of time, can't understand the last days unless you understand Israel and that Israel is a big part of God's prophetic clock. Amen. Because Jesus said he'd be rejected by his own people. But keep in mind, he was also accepted by some of his people. The early church was all Jewish. Amen? Amen? So it's kind of weird to say the church replaced Israel when the whole early church in Acts chapter 15 had a council as to whether or not Gentiles could even become part of the Christian church. It was all Jewish at first. Amen? And that was part of God's plan. But God also had a plan in regard to Israel as a nation. 
But Jesus said not one stone would be sitting on the temple. Amen? But then he indicated that the temple would be rebuilt because then he talked about how after that, the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And that there would be a restoration of Israel, the nation. There's all kinds of prophecies. That Israel, would, Israel would become a nation again. And if you stand against that reality, you're not only denying Scripture in very important areas, but you're also siding with the spirit of the age, which seeks to eradicate Israel, tacitly at the very least. But you're also standing against God. If you stand against Israel's existence as a nation, you're standing against God. And they're part of the prophetic clock. Remember, Jesus talked about when you see the fig tree bud, right? We've gone into Scripture showing that the fig tree is a picture of who? Israel as a nation. We got into the Scriptures and said this is their national symbol. And when they become a nation again, you're to, you're to keep your eyes open because the prophetic clock would begin ticking closer to midnight. And I've been telling you for a while now, I've been telling you, if, if you've, especially for those of you who've been into our ministry for years and years and years and years and years, you know, 30 plus years, I've warned over and over again of long before it became popular to warn about that the last day beast empire is largely Islamic based on the book of Daniel. And back in those days before 9-11 and the Twin Towers going down and everything, that was just kind of, you know, people just thought of Muslims over there having some oil and stuff, but they didn't see them in the end time scenario. And I've been saying that for years, not because I'm so smart, but because I have the Word of God. And I see what it says in the book of Daniel. I see what it says in the book of Revelation and so forth. So it's very, you know, a lot of talk about the red heifers that were sent from Texas to Israel. Because if you're going to reinstitute the sacrificial system, which will happen according to Daniel chapter 9, the Jews will not only have a rebuilt temple, but they'll reinstitute the sacrificial system. You have to have the red heifers. Not that our nation and our leaders don't use propaganda. Okay, and you stick to Jesus. Okay, trust him. Not any man not any government, trust the Lord and His Word. So we need to talk about some of these things. And it's very, very important. Uh, yeah, the red heifer fits into Bible prophecy, but we just don't know if it's these red heifers, okay? But Joe, what if it is? Yeah, I'm always looking, but I'm watching. But if they don't reinstitute the sacrificial system in at least some kind of makeshift temple, it becomes a moot point, right? So you got to watch the bigger picture as well. Because you're talking about all, everybody saying, this is a sign, this is a sign. Look at what the Bible says the signs are. Some of the signs are ha hatred toward Christianity. Jesus said we'd be hated for his namesake by every nation. Is that happening now? Oh, and anti-Semitism. The Jews would be hated because we know every nation one day will go against Israel to Armageddon and destroy her. Is that happening around a lot of the world? Yeah, it's happening right in our own country. Can you imagine if the, you know, uh, you know, the woke crowd was running the government and they're gaining more and more power? Many of them are very, very pro-Muslim and anti-Israel. Cortez and those gals, can you imagine if they were, had the buttons on the, the nukes? Ooh, man. Or their fingers on the buttons on the nukes. Access to the nukes, that would be pretty crazy. So when we look at these things, it's important to keep in mind that God's Word warns that these things would take place in the end of days. There's a lot of end time things that we could point to and say, wow, knowledge has increased of God's Word about the end times. Uh, technology has accelerated to where prophecies that could not be fulfilled, like the mark of the beast going out, to everybody have to take a mark, or, uh, the name of the beast or the number of the beast to buy or sell throughout the world. That couldn't have happened even 30, 40 years ago. That there'd be an image of the beast that's made in his image that speaks to the people and causes people to worship the beast. That couldn't happen before AI, you know. Not, you know what I'm saying? Now we've got, yeah, have you seen the Tom Cruise deal where it looks just like Tom Cruise? He's jumping on the couch and everything, you know, on Oprah. They've got a Tom Cruise. I don't, think, I don't know if he does it like that, but they've got an AI. It looks just like Tom Cruise talks like him and everything. And this is just getting, you know, it gets kind of scary because people can make you say things you didn't even say, and it sounds like your voice and everything. I don't know where this is all headed. It's pretty scary, though. Now, uh, it's interesting. Let's start getting into the Word together. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, there's a war that takes place in the heavenlies, in the spiritual realm. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Amen. There is a spiritual war afoot. And as a non-Christian, I used to poo-poo that idea, think it was ridiculous that Satan was real and all that, and I rejected Christianity because I was a very, you know, I was such a learned 16-year-old, you know, that Christianity was a myth. And uh, then I opened myself up to those very forces I thought were a joke and began to become assaulted and actually used by demonic powers. 
And I, many of you know my testimony. I cried out to the Lord, and he delivered me by his grace. And I was like, wow, this is very real. And when I opened this book, because I knew this was the book, because those powers were against this book. They were against the God of the Bible. They were against Jesus. I knew exactly who the Savior was because, they, because my songs are all anti-Christ. I'm like, hmm, wow. And then, boom, I opened this book, and it talks all about this spiritual war. But it also talks about different powers that are over nations, different powers, uh, principalities, and so forth, that, that have power over nations. And it's interesting because Gabriel, the angel Gabriel is at war. I mean, think, man, you think of boxing matches and who the best boxers are historically or MMA fighters. Well, man, you got angels that do hand-to-hand -hand combat. And Iran's been rattling its sabers. It's called for eliminating Israel from the planet. You know, the nation of Israel wiped them off the map. Well, the prince of Persia would be the demonic entity over what is now known as Iran. The name was changed from Persia to Iran. And Gabriel is fighting against the prince of Persia. Yet he's not able to be victorious. He fights for three weeks. Wow. Look at verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But who? Michael. Michael. He's, the arch, he's an archangel. One of the, he's a chief prince. One of the chief princes, Gabriel says, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. So he's explaining to Daniel why he was late in answering his prayer about the restoration of the nation of Israel. That was the question. About when are we restored to the land? The 70 years of captivity that was prophesied by Jeremiah the prophet, which he was just reading Jeremiah the prophet, Daniel. Those 70 years are up. Lord God, we humble ourselves before you. We deserve everything we've got. We deserve even worse. But our, the time is up. When are you going to restore us? And Gabriel's saying, hey, I would have been here sooner to answer your prayer. But I was being held up by the prince of Persia. God, God unveils a little bit what's going on in the spiritual world to give us insight that there's demonic principalities over countries. You're not going to see this stuff on CNN that I'm talking about right now. 60 Minutes or even Fox News, okay? Or even Newsmax, okay? Uh, typically, I'd be surprised. you say, oh, no, they did a whole study on Daniel 12, 10, 13. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear that, you know? But uh, it's interesting because Michael comes and helps. Why would Michael help in regard to Israel? Look at chapter 12, verse 1. What's his role? He has more than one, I'm sure. But look at J Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Now, it's talking about the, just before the tribulation period, look what happens. Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands, this is important, the great prince who stands what? Guard over the sons of your people will arise. Who's Daniel's people? Israel. Daniel, we already find in chapter 10, verse 13, that Michael's one of the chief princes. Now we see here that he stands guard over who? What nation? Israel. The archangel Michael guards Israel from destruction. It's important to learn these things. And a lot of preachers, they believe you just have a couple verses on a Sunday, you go real light because there's new people. I love new people so much. I want them to see what the Bible says about all these things, you know. So praise the Lord. And I love old people too, like Mark and my, myself. And, and uh, I'll, I'll stop right there. because I was already, already roasting Mark today. He looks really, really, really good for 45, man. Good, good job, Mark. I just made it for you, bro. <laughs> now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. Now, this is really interesting. Michael is going to arise, and there will be what? A time of distress or tribulation such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be what? Rescued. Even though there will be great tribulation against Israel, Daniel's people, like never before, okay, worse than the Holocaust, guys. It's going to be horrific. Those who are written in the book will be rescued. By the way, when Jesus said, by the way, when this takes place, he goes on to talk about the, the time, times, and half a time, right? The time, times, and half a time, the three and a half year great tribulation period. Sometimes we call the 70th week of Daniel the 70th week of Daniel. That's technically what we should call it. But sometimes it's called the tribulation period. But really, technically, the last three and a half years when the Antichrist sits in the temple saying that he's God and enforces the mark of the beast, that's the second half of Daniel's 70th week. That's the three and a half year period. That's the great tribulation period. That's when this goes down. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, he warned his disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, flee the mountains, right? That those who are in Judea flee and so forth and pray that it's not on the Sabbath and so forth. And then you know what he said? For at that time there'll be great tribulation like there's never been before and there will never be after. Same thing. So it's very easy to find out what time period he's talking about here. 
It's at the great tribulation period. Yet wait, he's going to arise, but doesn't say, give us any details as what happens when he arises. And what's crazy is he stands guard over his people, yet when he arises, hell breaks loose on earth against God's people like never before. It seems almost counterintuitive to what you'd expect. You think at that time, Michael will arise and he'll beat the, with the devil's booty and he'll cast him in the lake of fire. That's not what it says. It says, it says there'll be tribulation like never before on God's people. That's because it's the beginning of the great tribulation that lasts three and a half years. In fact, go to Revelation chapter 12. We're looking at the big picture, guys, today. The big picture spiritually, with regard to spiritual warfare that we are engaged in because you are part of spiritual warfare. Keep in mind, I mean, Daniel's praying. Did that affect spiritual warfare? Yeah. yeah. Michael came and assisted Daniel. I'm sorry, he assisted Gabriel. Hey, man. So Gabriel, go talk to Daniel. Your prayers are very, very important, you guys. There's a lot. Be sober. Be vigilant, the Bible says. For your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You ought to be standing, in, resist him in the faith, it says. You need to be praying. You'd be standing fast. You'd be involved in prayer because there are demonic powers arrayed against you and this church. Arrayed against our fellowships. So you'd be praying for the, this fellowship. Please, I say pray for me. Protection, strength, that I can declare the word of God properly so people can be saved and strengthened. But pray for the entire church. Pray for all of us. Amen. Pray for your own walk. Pray for your own families because the Bible says we're not supposed to be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Amen. And that we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand against them. There is a spiritual war. That's why you're supposed to be sober and be vigilant. Sober as opposed to drunk. A drunk is an easy person for Satan to destroy. And watchful. Just like you'd watch for a lion because he's like a roaring lion. So devour. You have a heads up spiritually. Ooh, I think the enemy's trying to get me to fall here. Oh, I think he's trying to hurt that person. I'll pray for them. Amen? The Bible says pray for all the saints as well. So in Daniel 12, we see this. But then in Revelation 12, look at verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of what? Twelve stars. Now, when you go to Revelation, and I'll have time to do all the cross-references for you. I just did this, by the way, in regard to just talking about spiritual warfare, not talking about Israel's future as much as spiritual warfare. At a men's retreat, we flew out to uh, Pennsylvania to do for the, our brothers back east, and we had a great time. But I went to Genesis chapter 35 and following, showing who is the woman with the 12 stars, sun and the moon. Anybody remember? Israel. Israel. Because who, a dream, who, who had the dream? Joseph, about 12 stars, sun and the moon, right? He's the 12 star, but 11 stars, sun and the moon, because he's the brother that all, everybody else is going to what? His mom, his dad, his, all his brothers, which represent, they're all the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Amen. They're going to they're bow down and worship him in the future. And they would literally come and bow down to him after he, they got wrecked, rejected him first, right? They tried to get rid of him. They threw him in a pit. They had him over to the Gentiles, just like they did with Jesus later. The descendants of the 12 tribes threw Jesus in a pit, had him over to the Romans, the Gentiles, but Joseph rose to the right hand of power of the Pharaoh, just like Jesus rose to the right hand of God. And he gave bread to the world, right? But what's interesting, then the brothers came and they bowed down to him. Remember that? They bowed down to him. And what's crazy, what's amazing, is that wasn't totally fulfilled. It says 12 stars, sun and the moon. Well, the 12 stars, sun and the moon, they're going to bow down to who? The one greater than Joseph. Messiah ben Joseph. Messiah ben David. Jesus in the future. So we see the imagery in Revelation is taken from the book of Genesis and that Israel is still in play in the last days. They haven't been replaced. God still sees his people. Amen. Verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. By the way, Israel is depicted as a woman and the wife of Yahweh. Now he does divorce her under the old covenant because she rejects him. Amen. Amen. But he says he'll make a new covenant with her. Not like the covenant he made with him at Mount Sinai. goes on to say that, which he does. Through Christ, amen? amen? Because God becomes a man and pays for their sins that they couldn't be saved from through the Old Testament and the sacrifices couldn't take away their sins, but God became a man. He took away their sins through his sacrifice on the cross, amen? Hallelujah. So we read in verse 2, and she was with child. That woman with child, that's Israel's with child. Who's the child that Israel's going to have? Jesus, Messiah. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Okay. Then, verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might what? Devour her child. Now in Revelation, who is the dragon? 
You can read a few verses later, verse 9. He's called the dragon, the old serpent, Satan, and the devil, all in one verse. Those same titles are used of Satan in Revelation chapter 20 as well. It's the serpent of old, the dragon, the, the diabolos, the devil, the satanas, the Satan, the opposer, the one who is, he's a rat, he's a fink, okay? He's a narc. Why would anybody want to worship the biggest narc on earth? He accused the brethren day and night. I worship a tattletale. Oh, I'm really impressed, okay? Because Satan's always trying to just bring everybody down with him. The last kind of entity you'd probably want to worship, at least the last one I would, I'd rather worship the God who made me, who loves me, who gave himself for me, amen, who created the heavens and the earth and will create a new heaven and earth and will reign with him forever and ever, amen? That's a better deal. And it's a free gift, by the way. It doesn't cost you your soul for eternity, mercy, and hell. Anyway, I digress a little bit. So I just, devil worship is just stupid. It really is, okay? And people that worship the devil, they, they're blind. Before I was a Christian, I was, didn't even realize I was worshiping the devil and I was. It's right, songs glorifying him and everything. And then it says that the devil we ridiculed in, Zechari- in Isaiah chapter 14, when it says that Lucifer will be brought down, and with him is musical instruments, with which it talks about how he deceived the world, the nations of the world. And they'll say to him, those, that are, those who are toast as well, those who are judged, being, who are damned to eternal punishment, they'll say to him, they'll say to one another, is this the one that made the world like a wilderness? Like they're in disbelief. He had any, the only power he has is the power that God's given him, guys. We'll be stripped of that power as will every rebel, ultimately, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I better get back to my notes. Okay. But God is good. Amen. So he got, wants to devour the child. I don't have time to read the entire chapter, but he's unsuccessful. Amen. Uh, the woman, uh, the, the child is born. Satan used Herod, remember? Remember the Christmas story? He energized Herod, the king, and put jealousy in his heart toward the coming Messiah, and he tried to eradicate Jesus as a child of the woman, the Messiah, but he failed. God had them flee into Egypt. I am so glad that when he finally decides to quote scripture, that he uses the very scripture that we actually use when we are refuting his claims and also the scripture from Revelation 12 that he's using because earlier he said that Revelation 12, the woman represented there was Israel. But now he's telling the truth that it was Jesus Christ that Satan was trying to devour and not Israel, the people. And it was Jesus who fled to Egypt, as we quote later. And just for the record, I'm showing this hermetic Kabbalah tree to represent what Joe is defending so fervently instead of defending truth 17 that's the spirit of this age the spirits of demons one out of the mouth of the beast one out of the mouth of the the false prophet one out of the mouth of the dragon revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 16 go forth the kings of the earth to bring them together against god at armageddon when they go they march to israel this is all a demonic movement guys when you talk about the destruction of israel and destruction of christians and they're even going to try to fight against christ at his second coming This is the Remnant Warrior, a.k.a. Pastor Jeremy Anderson from Kingdom Productions Network, one of the co-hosts of the Remnant Report, and today we are doing a very special program in hopes of clearing up some extreme dream misunderstanding that is taking place within the body of Christ because of some pretty well-known teachers who claim to be against dispensationalism and dispensational teachings. However, 
from what they have been teaching recently and what I have heard them teach about this same subject in the past, I, I don't see how they could ever be seen as anything but dispensational. And the teaching, which is a false doctrine that I am talking about today, is the man-made theology of, and now this comes directly from dispensationalism, but it's called replacement theology. And this so-called replacement theology is based on how dispensationalists interpret the relationship between Old Covenant Israel and the New Covenant Church. The belief is that it is heresy and we and I say we because my guest who will be joining me here in a minute is not really a guest. He is definitely a brother here at Kingdom Productions Network. And I hope he considers myself a brother at Kingdom Theology. But it's Pastor Christopher Chapman, who you guys are very familiar with, and What he and I both teach has been called heresy by a pretty popular and well-known teacher in the YouTube online community as well as his church in Simi Valley, California. Um, I'm going to be playing his actual video so you see what we are responding to so there's no need hiding the name it is pastor joe schimmel from uh, blessed hope chapel in simi valley and also good fight ministries he is the founder and pastor of both ministries and one of course is a church which makes this that much more serious and dangerous, but before I bring Pastor Chapman on to discuss exactly what the, we're going to start off looking at what the correct system or view of theology is, because there are many, but there are only about three main views within Orthodox Christianity, and we are going to be looking at at least three views. There there are definitely more than three, but before I bring Pastor Chapman on to talk about the correct view of eschatology, I just want to look at a passage of scripture that I'm sure he's probably going to go over as well. We're going to be looking at quite a few scriptures when we are talking together, but Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within their hearts and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, 
and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more, thus saith the Lord who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon, and the stars for light by night. Now, the Lord is saying here that not only will he make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and the house of Judah, but it will not be like the covenant that he made with their fathers. It'll be a new covenant. And in this covenant, we're going to find out here pretty soon that this covenant is also going to include all people. And he, the Lord literally says that I'm going to call them my people, which were not my people. And we're going to see this in the New Testament. We're going to see Paul go back to this scripture in the Old Testament and use it when talking about the relationship between Israel and the church. So, at the beginning of this, you may want to make a judgment without hearing the scriptures and without hearing what Pastor Chapman and I have to say and just go ahead and judge us as heretics and say that we are teaching something called replacement theology. It would be very, very easy for you to do that, especially in these times that we are living in where the modern nation state of Israel, which those like Pastor Joe Schimmel and others believe is the fulfillment of end times Bible prophecy, both the nation of Israel and what's happening over there. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of a spoiler, and that is that every bit of that comes from dispensationalism. But I'm going to stop and turn it over to my brother and allow him to explain which is the correct view of eschatology. A very important question. How do we interpret the Old Testament? I got saved in high school. I began to read the Bible, mostly the New Testament. When I would jump into the Old Testament, I did not know how to apply it to my life. It didn't seem to make sense in light of the New Testament. New Testament, I'm supposed to love my enemy, and the Old Testament, I'm supposed to kill the Canaanites. And the New Testament, do not get divorced except for sexual immorality, and the Old Testament, as long as you write a certificate of divorce, all is well. And so I'd see these contradictions in the Old and New Testament, and I didn't really know how to deal with them. Now, throughout the years, as I've wrestled with this issue, I've seen that basically all the main all the main systems of interpretation are made to try to figure out how do we connect the Old and the New Testament together. And a lot of errors come from this. You can think of, for example, the Hebraic Roots Movement. Their idea is that they want to interpret everything in the whole Bible through the Law of Moses. Uh, whereas you come to something like the, the Faith Movement. Uh, you know, In the Charismatic Circles, they have the, the Faith Movement, which bas basically says name it and claim it. But there's a principle that they have. Basically, obey everything that's commanded in the New Testament, and then God will give you all the blessings that are promised in the Old Testament. And so they mix the commands of the New and the promises of the Old, and so it becomes an error, a strange error at that, that they uh, mix up the Old and the New Covenants. And so I want to kind of look, in this video, I want to kind of look at a few of the options that are on the market, 
and kind of point out why they are wrong and then kind of say what is very clear from the Bible, how we are supposed to come to Scripture. Now, basically, when we come to the Bible, the idea for uh, most born-again believers is that we just come to the Bible, we study it in context, we read what it says, we believe what it says, and we practice what it says. Yeah, whether you're in the free grace movement or whether you're in the Hebraic roots movement or whether you're a Jehovah's Witness or whatever you may be, that's how you will come to the scriptures. You will come to the, with the idea that Christianity is found in the teaching of the Bible and we just need to come to the teaching of the Bible and that will show us what we're supposed to believe and practice. The problem is everybody comes to different conclusions. And so we have to ask, why is that? You know, in the Reformation, they said sola scriptura, that the, the, the scripture, the Bible is the sole or the foundational rule for our faith. And yet the Lutherans and the Zwinglians and the Calvinists disagreed with one another, though they held to that same principle. And nowadays, if you go to a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or an Anglican church, whichever church you go to, you're going to find a different flavor. And even among people in that church, they're going to have different interpretations, even on the same passages with the same context. So... We can't be naive to think that we can just come to the scripture and as long as we study it uh, honestly that we're going to come to the right conclusion. That is not true. Actually, when we come to the scripture, we're going to come with a paradigm. We're going to come with a lens that we view the scripture through. And so the main key is that we make sure that we're looking at the scripture through the biblical lens, that we have the right key to interpretation. Now, all these different systems will present a key of interpretation and say, this is how you interpret the scriptures. This is where you start. Basically, what they're doing is this. If you have a puzzle with a thousand pieces and you throw them all on the table and then you say, now put this puzzle together, people might fit it together in all different kinds of ways. They might kind of force some pieces together, do all different kinds of things, but, but you really can't put the puzzle together unless you have the picture on the front of the box. You've got to look at the picture on the front of the box and from that, then you'll be able to put the pieces together. In the same way, when we come to the scripture, we've got books of the Bible, we've got passages, we've got chapters, we've got verses, and all these little pieces that need to be fit together into one coherent idea. And how do we do that? We have to have something that we start with, a view or a, a paradigm that we look through and that we're able to understand what the main point of the scripture is. Uh, it's being able to try to understand, you know, uh, how to view the scripture as a whole or, or individually in the individual passages, we need to be able to know how they're supposed to fit together, just like the puzzle pieces. Now, uh, I'm going to share just briefly, share a few different options that are on the market. Now, the first one is going to be what I would call the, uh, the living authority. In other words, this it belongs to the Roman Catholic Church, to Jehovah's Witness, to Mormons, uh, to many groups, even some evangelicals, they will follow their pastor and just do whatever their pastor says. Basically, it's an authority. There's some sort of authority that helps us to interpret the scripture. So it gives us a lens. So we might go to the, uh, the popes and they'll tell us what the Bible means. We might go to the Watchtower Society and that society, that organization will tell us what we're supposed to believe and how we're supposed to interpret the Bible. Uh, the, the living apostles and prophets in the Church of, uh, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will interpret the scriptures for us. So every cult, uh, every main organized cult, I should say, what they will do is they'll say, look, we agree that the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Whether it's uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, they'll all say this. But then the next thing they'll say is, but the only way to Jesus Christ is through their organization. So they'll say, yes, you can only get to God through Jesus, but you can only get to Jesus through us. That organization becomes the mediator between man and Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the mediator between man and God. And so we need to understand that when we come to the scripture, we come to the scripture that was written by the whole, that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would be the one that would teach us and lead us into all truth. He's the one that inspired the scripture, and he is the one that will testify to us about Jesus Christ in the scripture so that we can understand what the scripture is teaching. So we don't go to some authority that is on this earth apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what guides us into all truth. And so that is the living authority that we appeal to. But even when we appeal to living authority and people will say, well, I have the Holy Spirit and I say this, I have the Holy Spirit and I say this, we still have to have a basic principle that God in his word, that the Holy Spirit in his word teaches us by which we can interpret the scripture. And so we'll get to that, but I want to, uh, what that interpretation principle is, but first let's look at a, lo a couple other uh, keys or principles that are used. There's the Hebraic Roots Movement. Now the Hebraic Roots Movement will say this, 
They'll say, look, the beginning of the scripture, the foundation of it is the, the Torah, the first five books of Moses. And they'll say the law of Moses is what was given to the people of Israel, and that is by what we're supposed to interpret all truth through. So when they come to the New Testament, they come to the teaching of Jesus Christ, they'll say, look, Jesus is not going to teach anything contrary to the Old Testament law. He's only going to give commentary on the Old Testament law. So Jesus basically becomes, instead of becoming the Messiah and the, the king that gives us uh, the law on the Sermon on the Mount, instead, he becomes a commentator on Moses' law. So Moses and the law of Moses becomes the foundation. And so when they come to the scripture, they need to make sure if they read something, for example, if they read in Galatians where it says that uh, Paul says that we are not to be circumcised, they have to reinterpret that they have, because the law says we must be circumcised. So they will say, no, we still need to be circumcised. We just don't get circumcised. Paul means in Galatians, they will say, Paul means that we don't get circumcised in order to be justified. We do it after we're justified because we are walking in faith and obedience to God. So they will have to twist around what Paul says in order to fit it into that mold of the Old Testament law. Now, another, uh, another view or another way is, I would say, is rationalism. Now, rationalism comes is the dispensationalist model. The dispensationalist model will say that, look, everything in the Old Testament, if you're going to interpret it correctly, you have to interpret it by literal historical context. There can be no second meaning. There can no, be no mysterious meaning. It has to be fulfilled exactly the way that it was prophesied. So when you come to the New Testament and the Jews were expecting a a Messiah that would come and put down all other nations and would raise up Israel to be over all the other nations. They say that understanding that the Jews had is correct. They rejected Messiah, and so it's going to come in the future at another time. So they will interpret the scripture through dispensations. So they'll say, look, the Old Testament is completely separate from the New Testament. It's a completely different thing because their different dispensations have to be interpreted in different ways. So they'll interpret the Old Testament and say it's not fulfilled yet in Jesus Christ, and they'll interpret the New Testament and say now we're under the uh, gospel of grace and the dispensation of grace, different from the dispensation of law under the Old Testament. So this idea will be that you have to come with idea of dispensation. How do you interpret each section of scripture and you inter interpret them each differently? Of course, this is not found in scripture. They'll often appeal to uh, the passage that says rightly, rightly dividing the word of scripture, which just means studying the scripture rightly, making sure that we understand it, that we don't uh, abuse the scripture, but they will always quote the King James Version and say rightly dividing and saying, that's saying that we're supposed to divide the Old Testament from the New Testament. We're supposed to divide, you know, Paul's letters from Peter's letters, from the Gospels, from the book of Acts, and they, they go through about dividing and cutting asunder the scriptures, which God joined together. So this is another way that they have a, a rationalistic tendency that everything has to be put into a box and then interpreted that way. But we can't come to scripture that way because scripture doesn't tell us to do that. Uh, if we come to another, we have covenant theology. Now, covenant theology, if you were going to say, okay, covenant theology means the covenant with Noah, the covenant with David, the covenant with uh, Moses, the covenant through Christ are all different covenants and they have slightly different terms. Okay, maybe that would be reasonable, but that's not what covenant theology teaches. What covenant theology teaches is the basic is that there is two basic covenants, the covenant of law and the covenant of grace. And they say that both the covenant of law and the covenant of grace have been from the beginning. So when they come to the Old Testament, they'll say, look, David was saved through the covenant of grace. He was saved by God's mercy uh, through faith in the coming Messiah. And so because of that, he was saved and he was born again in the same way that we are. Now, of course, he couldn't have been born again the same way we are because when we're born again, we're raised up and seated with Christ who died and rose again. But when David uh, was living on this earth, Christ was not seated at the right hand of God as a man. He was not making intercession. He was not yet exalted. And so we couldn't be raised up with him. And so there's many ways we can look at this and understand that the, what was happening in the Old Testament when they were saved through trusting in God and they were justified through faith is different than what we have in the New Testament when we receive the Holy Spirit. But the main point is this. When we come to the Bible, we don't see a covenant of law and a covenant of grace. We see the Old Testament law of Moses and the new covenant uh, that, was, that God prophesied would come, but we don't see this covenant of law that goes all the way back to Adam in the garden and when he broke the law, he was supposed to perfectly fulfill it and if you don't perfectly fulfill the, co law of, uh, the, the covenant of law, then you're fallen and then grace is what picks you up. This is just invented. It is not in scripture, it's not found in scripture that there is these two covenants. Now, what we find in scripture is much different. And Paul was certainly not talking about that when he's talking about the covenant of law works according to the law of Moses or faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the two things that he contracts, not the uh, a covenant, uh, imaginary covenant of law and imaginary covenant of grace. So how do we come to the scripture? 
Well, what we do come to the scripture with is, first of all, we need to find something, a detail that tells us exactly how to interpret the scripture. And we find that if we flip over here to, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, this is Jesus after he's risen from the dead. He says this in verse 44. He said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So he's going to tell them what the Old Testament means. When we go to the Old Testament, we see Sabbaths and we see feasts and we see coming out of Egypt and Passover and we see all these things. But Jesus said, you search the scriptures, uh, and, but you refuse to come to me, even though they testify about me, but you refuse to come to me and find life. So the scriptures testify about Jesus Christ. So what is the key to the scriptures? What is the key to understanding the Old Testament? Jesus Christ. And here it says this, verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So right here, he's speaking to his apostles and he opens their minds to understand what was written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. He's going to show them what was revealed about said concerning me. So what is written about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, he's now revealing it to them. It had been a mystery because the people in the Old Testament did not understand what they were writing about. Uh, there's a place, uh, I think it's in Peter, where it says that they searched diligently to understand about the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow, but it was shown to them that it was not revealed to them, but it was written down for us. And so there's a, a mystery in the Old Testament that's revealed in the New Testament, and here we find Jesus doing it. Verse 46, he said to them, thus it is written. So here's the definition of what is written in the Old Testament. Here's how we read the Old Testament. Here's the key. This is the writing of Jesus in, in scripture. Thus it was written, and accordingly it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So the Old Testament is prophesying the coming of Jesus Christ, dying on a cross, rising from the dead, and then the gospel going out from Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the earth to all the nations that those that repent and turn to God through him would find the forgiveness of sins. This is what the Old Testament is about. We see this again if we turn over to Colossians. If we turn over to Colossians, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says the same thing. But he says this, For this reason I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. You may have heard of the administration of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have written all briefly already, by which when you read it, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. So Christ is the mystery, the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he would die, that he would rise again, that he would be made Lord of heaven and earth. We see that in Ephesians chapter one, I believe verse uh, 11, maybe 10 and 11, maybe nine. In verse five here, Ephesians three, verse five which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, how the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So the Old Testament was prophesying that Christ would come and that through him all nations would be blessed through the gospel. That's why it says in Galatians chapter 3 that the gospel is preached ahead of time to uh, Abraham whenever he told him that, that all nations would be blessed through him. So Paul's saying that, look, in the Old Testament, they wrote these things down, but they didn't understand it until now God has revealed it to the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament. So it doesn't say the apostle. Uh, those in the so-called mid-Acts dispensationalist movement will say that only Paul got this revelation. But no, this was given the same revelation that the, the, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members and partakers of the promise by the gospel was also given in Luke chapter 24. So this was always the message. So when we go to the Old Testament, it's different than reading the New Testament. The Old Testament, or the New Testament, we read in one way. We go to the context, we look to what it says, and we try to understand what the author is speaking. But when we go to the Old Testament, there's two ways we interpret it. One, we interpret it historically. We go to the context, historical, uh, cultural context, to the, the scriptural context. We look at it in context, and we come away with what was actually being said. What did the readers understood was being said to them? But there's a second way that we come to the Old Testament scripture. We come with the apostolic revelation. We come from the teaching of the New Testament will tell us what the Old Testament is revealing. I think of an example in Matthew, uh, maybe chapter one or chapter two, when Jesus was coming back from Egypt after going, running away from Herod, when he was coming back, Matthew said this, he said, this fulfilled what was written, uh, that out of Egypt I've called my son. <coughs> Excuse me. But when you go to the context of that, it was talking about Israel being brought out of Egypt. 
So what is Matthew talking about? He's giving apostolic revelation about the true and deeper meaning of the Old Testament. And that deeper meaning is not uh, some special revelation that some so-called wannabe prophet is going to tell, tell everybody, I've got this special revelation. I understand the book of Revelation better than everybody else. It's not talking about that. The revelation is Jesus Christ. So when Matthew said, out of Egypt, I've called my son, he says, look, the prophet who wrote this down, I think, believe it was Hosea, did not understand what was being said fully. They were talking about Israel, but something more complete has now taken place because now Jesus Christ has come out of Egypt and this fulfills the prophecy. So we see that there's two layers of Old Testament reading. So we don't read it rationalistically like those in the dispensationalist camp would want us to read it. They would want us to read that everything that hasn't uh, literally fulfilled in the way that a Jewish person would imagine it's going to be fulfilled in the, uh, in the Old Testament, if it hasn't been fulfilled that way, then they'll say it's not fulfilled yet. And so they don't understand that Jesus Christ is now seated on the throne of David. As it says in Acts chapter 2, David was a prophet and he said that his descendant would sit on the throne and he foresaw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God, seated at the hand, uh, right hand of the Father, that is him seated on the throne of David. He has fulfilled the Old Testament scripture. It's not the way they thought it was going to happen, but it is the way it came to pass. So when we come to the Old Testament, we need to come to it, reading it in its Old Testament context, but then we have a further understanding that we understand through the writings of the apostles who had revelation and direct understanding from Jesus Christ himself, their minds had been opened to the scriptures, they understood what the scriptures were about concerning him, that the scriptures were about him, him dying, rising again according to the scriptures, and that through him, the gospel would go to all nations and all nations would be blessed. Everybody that turned in repentance to Jesus Christ, uh, uh, through Jesus Christ, would be saved. Amen, brother. That was probably the best explanation of the cor not only the correct view of theology, but an overview of the really the main views of theology that people hold to today and not only an overview but a good look at the correct view of theology that honestly in my opinion, can only be called orthodox theology. It's not anything that wasn't taught in the original church of Acts by the apostles or in the Antinicene period. It is what you and I, I would say, I believe we both call it this, kingdom theology it is not covenant theology by any means and a lot of people mistake us for those who hold covenant theology but that is absolutely not what we teach or believe in now I appreciate you allowing us to play the video that you did explaining the correct view of theology and I think that it was a lot easier and better to just play that video than it would have been you know for you to just explain all of that over again when you had already done a video on it but I am, if I had to choose anyone to come on with me and fight this lie that is being told about men of God like you and men like me, I, I am not quick to call myself a man of God only because I try to stay humble lest I fall, if you know what I mean. But I, I am a man of God in the sense that I trust in Jesus Christ, follow Jesus Christ with all my heart, love God with all my heart, 
would give my life for the cause and name of Jesus Christ. I love my brother with all my heart. I follow the Sermon on the Mount and the other commands of Christ to the best of my ability. Of course, I slip up and I make mistakes just like we all do. But one thing neither one of us are is people teaching heresy. Now, you have explained the correct view of theology, and you talked about dispensationalism. Well, dispensationalism is responsible for the accusation and the, the creation. I don't think people realize this. They are also responsible for the creation of the man-made doctrine of replacement theology. Without dispensationalism creating this made-up theology, it wouldn't exist. Now, this is a belief, according to them, that we hold to, and since we hold to and follow the very same things that were held by the apostles and the anti-Nicene writers like uh, Polycarp, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, um, you know, even Tertullian to an extent. Um, and I admire Tert Tertullian tremendously. I just think that you know he was so he was so dogmatic on so many things but then decided to give on the subject of baptism um you know he he, he was never for infant baptism but it, to try and compromise, which is what he wanted to, you know, kind of throw the book and excommunicate so many others for doing was compromising. Um, I was on something much more serious in his view, but, you know, sin is sin in the eyes of God, and I'm not saying that anybody sinned because I wasn't there but you know he also compromised he compromised and said you know you know infant baptism was too early wait till they were like toddlers and I'm paraphrasing of course but in in any case we follow the same beliefs that they held and followed so if they're calling us heretics and the believers in replacement theology, then they are also calling them heretics because they believe the same thing. And much more than that, they are calling Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, as well as the other apostles, but those are just the, the two main ones that we're going to be talking about and reading from today, they are calling Jesus, who would be the one who created the the doctrine that they call heresy, and Paul, the main teacher of the doctrine that they call heresy, heretics as well. And I don't think people realize that. So we're going to show people exactly what Jesus taught and exactly what Paul taught regarding the church and Israel because this will absolutely set the record straight when it comes to this so-called man-made doctrine and I, I, I 
meant so-called doctrine, but this man-made so-called doctrine of replacement theology. Before I unmute you and mute myself, what is the question that they struggle with? I mean, what's the thing that they get so wrong? I'm going to ask the question, how does the church relate with Israel? Are they this, is, is the church the same thing as Israel? Is it completely separate? What is the relationship of the New Covenant church, body of Christ, with the Old Testament Israel? We're looking at this in light of different theological systems that we've been considering, Hebraic roots, uh, dispensationalism, covenant theology. And we've also been trying to understand how, as a Christian, as disciples of Jesus Christ, should we read the Old Testament. Now, we've summarized that we should read the New Testament in one way. We should read it in context, trying to understand what the apostles are trying to teach. But the Old Testament is read in two different ways. We read it, one, in context, historically, understanding what was going on at the time and what the original readers understood. But also we read it prophetically through the lens of Jesus Christ, that we see him, his kingdom, and his salvation prophesied in the Old Testament. That though the Old Testament uh, prophets didn't understand exactly what they were saying, they didn't understand it was a mystery to them. In the New Testament, Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44, Jesus opens the minds of the apostles to understand the Old Testament. So today we're going to focus in on how is the church related to Israel. Now, as we looked at the three different theological systems, the one that actually gets closest to the biblical model is surprisingly going to be the Hebraic roots model. Now, I'm sure in the Hebraic roots camp and in, in that movement, there's a lot of debate about this, but of the teachers in the Hebraic roots movement that I've listened to, usually they have the idea that the promises were made in the Old Testament to the to Israel, uh, to the Old Testament Israel, but they are now include Gentiles. Gentiles can be grafted into Israel in the New Testament. This is, of course, why they argue and say that so we should also be obeying the Old Testament law, which is completely false and what Paul argued against throughout his ministry. We see it in Galatians and just about everywhere. He's arguing against the fact of the Judaizers that were saying that people in the body of Christ needed to keep the laws of Moses. They needed to keep the uh, circumcision and all the other laws that were peculiar to the law of Moses. So they're not right in that, but they are right in the fact that Israel received the promises and now those promises are continued on in the new covenant and Gentiles can be grafted in to Israel. Now let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31 and we see this is the promise. So the new covenant is for the people of Israel. 31, surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt because they broke my covenant Although I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within their in them and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So we see, first of all, that he's speaking to Israel, to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So that means the, the whole people of Israel. And he's giving them promise of a new covenant that will be different than the covenant that was made with the people that came out of Israel. Now we see something interesting here that he's going to write his law on their heart. And that each of them are going to know the Lord. See, in the old covenant, they had priests and, and they had prophets that you had to go and you had to learn and be taught to know the Lord. Because in the old covenant, they did not all have the spirit of God. So they did not all know the Lord. But Jesus says, this is eternal life to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So in the new covenant, when somebody repents and turns from their rebellion against God and they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're reconciled to God and they receive the spirit of God. And so then they know God. They're they're walking with God. And so though we have teachers in the body of Christ, though there is preaching and all kinds of things that we learn from the Bible, we're not teaching other Christians to know the Lord because they already know the Lord. We're teaching them to grow in their knowledge and grace of, of Jesus Christ. And so it's different than what we're teaching the unbelievers, those that are not in the new covenant. We're teaching them to know the Lord, to be reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here that the law is going to be written on their hearts. We see in Ezekiel chapter... 
36, I believe, verse 27, we see that that God is going to give us a new heart. He's going to circumcise our old heart, take out the old stony heart, and give us a new heart of flesh that will obey the commands of God. And that's what we see happening in the New Testament, that we receive the law of God, which is love God and love your neighbor, and that by the Spirit of God, we can walk that out. So here's where the dilemma begins. And this is the dilemma that Paul was trying to explain in in several of his letters, Ephesians, uh, Galatians, and Romans. He's trying to explain how is it that if God promised the new covenant to Israel, but in, in Paul's day, in the time of the New Testament, most of the Jewish people rejected Messiah and rejected the new covenant. If that's the case, doesn't that ruin God's plan? Because he made a promise to give them a new covenant, but because of their unbelief, then they don't enter into that new covenant. So what's the deal with that? If we turn to Romans chapter 9, we will see that that's what Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 9. This has often been used as a a proof text for uh, determinism, but it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what Paul was dealing with. He was dealing with those that were uh, Judaizers and also with unbelieving Jews that were claiming that their ancestry gave them a right to uh, the the new co- or to the new covenant, and they were saying that this Jesus is not the one. So they were rejecting Messiah. So let's look at verses 1 through 5. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ from my brethren, my kinsmen by race, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, to whom belong the patriarchs, and from whom, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is over all, God forever blessed. Amen. So he's grieving over the fact that the majority of the Israelites had rejected Messiah, and they had rejected the new covenant. And so this is something he's grieved, because actually the scriptures were given to them, the promises were given them, promises like we just read in Jeremiah chapter 31. If we jump back to Romans chapter 3, we read this starting in verse uh, starting in verse 1. What advantage then does the Jew have or what profit is there in circumcision much in every way chiefly because th- the oracles of God were entrusted to them. So what's the benefit of being Jewish? If salvation is both for Jew and Gentile, what was the benefit for being Jewish? It says Primarily that they were given the oracles of God. So they had knowledge of the who the living God was, who the creator was, and what his plan for humanity was. Verse 3, what if some did not believe? So what if, what if the Jews rejected Messiah and the new covenant? What if some did not believe? Would their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? In other words, would the unbelief of the Jews ruin the plan of God? And and verse 4 says, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may prevail in your judgment. So he's saying, even though they rejected Messiah, even though they rejected the new covenant, that doesn't mean that the plan of God has been thwarted. We see it if we jump back to Romans chapter 9, after his grief over Israel and bringing up the fact that, you know, they have rejected Messiah and they've rejected the promises. He goes on in verse 6. And he says this, because the next question would be then, if that's the case, then the plan of God is ruined. And so verse 6 says this, it is not as though the word of God has failed. So Paul's trying to say that, yes, God made promises to Israel. And yes, Israel, the large percentage of them did not believe. And so they rejected those promises. But this has not ended the plan and the promise of God. But how can this be? He goes on to say in the second part of verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So what is he saying here? They are not all part of the Israel of God. They're not part of God's holy people, Israel, who are just because they are descended from Jacob. So it's not because they are from Jacob who was called Israel because they have that natural lineage. Not because of that are they part of the Israel of God. And so he's going to make an argument uh, throughout uh, the rest of this chapter, particularly in verses seven through nine. We can look here. He says, nor are they all children because they are descendants of Abraham, but in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. So those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So it's not through lineage from Jacob. And he goes on in verse seven and says, nor is it from lineage from Abraham, because we know that Abraham had Ishmael and he was not accepted as uh, the descendant, uh, he was not accepted as the one that would receive the promise. He also, then I- Isaac had 
uh, Jacob and Esau, but Esau was not the one to receive the promise. So the argument here is this, is not everybody that is born and descended from Abraham is going to be a child and receive the promise that was given to Abraham. What is that promise? That he would be the heir of all nations. He said, I'll make of you a great nation, and from that nation I will bless all the nations of the earth. So we're, we're here asking the question. So look in verse, uh, look in verse 8. So those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. So who would the children of the flesh be? Those that were naturally descended. Remember, Paul has been talking about the fact that the Jews rejected, the large percentage of them rejected Messiah. That didn't ruin God's plan because God doesn't count his people Israel according to natural lineage. That's what he's saying here. But the children of promise are counted as descendants. So we must ask, who are these children of promise? If we jump back to Romans chapter 4, we read it here. Romans chapter 14. How does somebody become a child of promise? If it's, if it's not through lineage, if it's not because we're born from Jacob, from the line of Jacob, then how does one become a child of promise? How does one become a child of Abraham? How does one receive this blessing and the promises that were given in the old covenant to the house of Israel? How does one become part of Israel that receives the promises? Verse 16, therefore the promise comes through faith so that it might be by grace that the promise would be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it said in verse 13, it was not through the law that Abraham and his descendants received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are become heirs, faith would be made void and the promise nullified because the law produces wrath for there where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore, the promise comes through faith. So how do we become children of Abraham? We become children of Abraham, not by just being born of a natural lineage, but through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as it said over in chapter four, verse 23. Now the words it was credited to him were not written for his sake only, but also for us to whom it is credited if we believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our transgressions and was raised up for our justification. So through faith in Jesus Christ, we become the children of Abraham. We become the children of promise. And in the context of Romans chapter nine, that means we become the Israel of God and also the children of God because we're born again as God's children through faith. As verse eight said, Romans nine, eight. So those who are the children of the flesh flesh are not the children of God. Who are those children of the flesh? Those that are only born naturally, as Paul was talking about in verse 1 through 5. They are born naturally, but they rejected Messiah. They are not the children of God. Only those that receive Christ through faith are the children of God. Let's flip over to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 4. Now, if you followed any of the teaching on Calvinism, then you've heard a lot of this before, but it's important that we understand the reason we deal with this passage so much when we're dealing with uh, Calvinism is because if we use them to teach determinism, then we don't understand exactly what they are trying to teach, what Paul is actually explaining to us. So we need to understand these things. So if we turn over to Galatians chapter 4, and let's see here. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse 21. Now, Paul's going to use an allegory. He's going to talk about Ishmael and Hagar, and he's going to talk about Isaac and Sarah. And he's going to tell us that this is an analogy between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, those that live according to the law and those that live through faith. So I'm just going to read it here. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. But he who is a slave woman was born according to the flesh, as it said in Romans chapter uh, 9, uh, those, those that are according to the flesh are not the children of God. But he of the free woman through the promise. So by Sarah was the woman of promise, through Hagar was the woman uh, of the flesh. 24, these things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one is from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and represents the present Jerusalem and is in bondage with her children. So, how are they in bondage? They were in bondage because they were in bondage to the law of Moses. And it, the, not that the law of Moses is bad, but when you reject Jesus Christ and choose the law of Moses, that is bondage because there is no salvation in the law. There is only salvation in Jesus Christ. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem, which is above is free, which is our mother. Jump to first. 28. Now we brothers, like Isaac, are the children of promise. But as it was then, 
he who was born after the flesh persecuted him who was born after the spirit, so it is now also. So in the same way that Ishmael persecuted uh, Isaac, so in Paul's day, many of the unbelieving Jews were persecuting the church and causing it to spread, and they were persecuting Paul himself. Even Paul, before he was saved, was a, a member, and he was all of, of national Israel that was also persecuting the church. Verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So here what we have, oh, verse sorry, 31. So then, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So what we have here is Paul teaching that though people were descended from Israel naturally, though they were from the line of Jacob, if they reject Christ, they would be rejected and cast out and have no inheritance in Israel. If they rejected Christ, they're rejecting the new covenant and all the promises that were given to, uh, to Israel. But if the Gentiles who were not given that promise, if they believe in the Jewish Messiah, if they accept him and submit to him as the Lord of all, then through that they are grafted into Israel and they become the children of promise. They become Isaac, even though some that were descended from Isaac naturally but rejected Messiah were cast out. How can this be? Let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. Brothers, I am speaking to you in human terms, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet if it is ratified, no one annuls it or adds to it. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, meaning many, but and to your seed, meaning the one who is Christ. Now it's important to understand what Paul's argument was in Romans 9. He says, look, not everybody who's born from Abraham is going to be a child of promise. And even those that are born of Isaac are not going to be a child of promise uh, because Ishmael or uh, Esau was born from Isaac, but it's only Jacob that receives the promise. So he's saying it's not the, uh, he's saying this, God is, has the right to limit who receives the promise. So first he gives the promise to Abraham and then he limits it only to Isaac's line, not to Ishmael's line. Then God limits it again when it comes to Esau and Jacob. He says, oh, it's only going to be through Jacob. It's not going to be through Esau. And so now what we see in the new covenant is God is doing once again what he has the prerogative to do. He is limiting which uh, line the salvation and the blessings and the promises of the old covenant come through. Namely, they come through the line of Jesus Christ. So the seed, the one who received the promise is Jesus Christ. He is the seed, the one seed. Verse 17, and this I say, that the law which came 430 years later does not annul the covenant that was ratified by God in Christ so as to nullify the promise. So the promise given to Abraham was actually given to Jesus Christ. And those that are in Jesus Christ will be part of the children of Abraham, part of the Israel of God and receive the promises. But those that reject Jesus Christ, even though they are from Isaac, even though they are from Jacob, even though they are from Abraham by natural lineage, it does not matter. Even if they keep the law of Moses, that does not matter because the law came after the promise and it doesn't wash away the promise. But the promise is fulfilled in the seed, Jesus Christ. Verse, 30, or verse 18, for if the inheritance comes through the law, it no longer comes through the promise, but God gave it to Abraham through promise. Now again, how do we enter into this? Look at verse 26. You are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So how do we become the lineage that comes through Messiah? Not by being born, not by a natural lineage, but through faith. Because when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we become the children of God. Remember, Romans 9, 8 said, it's not those that are born according to the flesh that are the children of God, but it's those that are born according to the spirit. Those that are born according to faith, we become the children of God. So you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many as of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. We identify with Christ. Verse 28, Therefore, there is there neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, and there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all the promises of God about the new covenant, not the Old Testament. The Old Testament had laws like do not eat this, do not touch that. And then it had promises. You'll inherit this land. You, you'll defeat your enemies. You will have great crops. Okay, that was all part of the old covenant. But that old covenant, God promised Israel he was going to make a new and different covenant. 
And this new and different covenant was going to have God's law written on our hearts. It was going to be a new form of the law that was going to be the righteous requirements of the law, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, and and, and I believe in uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 26. And so the new covenant is going to be different than the old. But how do we become part of the new covenant? It's not only through natural lineage, but it's through faith in Jesus Christ, whether Jew or or Gentile, we can be part of the Israel of God. If there is someone who is Jewish by natural descent, but they reject Christ, they will be cut off and they will not have an inheritance. They will be like the slave woman's son who was cast off from the inheritance, like Esau who sold his birthright for a bit of porridge. If they cling to the law and they reject Christ, then they're selling their birthright and they're they're being rejected. But If they are children of promise, that they believe in the gospel and they trust in Jesus Christ, then they will be grafted into Israel and the new covenant will belong to them. This is what the the scripture is teaching. We can see this uh, further if we go into uh, Romans chapter 11. We see that the, the people of God is an olive tree and that those that believe among Jew or Gentile are in. Those that are naturally Jewish that believe, they stay right in their natural olive tree because the Jewish Messiah was promised to them and they receive it through faith. But then those that don't receive will be grafted out. They will be taken out. They'll snapped off of the olive tree. And then Gentiles who are not from the natural olive tree will be grafted in through faith. And they will remain in there as long as they continue to trust in Christ, as it says in Romans chapter 11. So we see that the Israel of God, it's... It has a, a, an important connection with the church. So let's put it this way. So what about dispensationalism? Dispensationalism says, here's Israel, and then the church is completely different and completely distinct. That is not true. So we can say this. The church is Israel. In what way can we say it? Because Israel was a type and a shadow of what the church was going to be. And now the church is the fulfillment of, of what was prophesied, the promise of this new covenant that all the nations would hope in Christ, that through, through, through Abraham's seed, all the nations would be blessed. Through Jesus Christ, all nations would be blessed. So whenever uh, dispensationalism separates the church and, and Israel so far apart, they are not going according to scripture because the church is the fulfillment of the promises given in the Old Testament about the New Testament to come to Israel. But on the other hand, Covenant theology tries to make the church uh, and Israel exactly the same. They say that Israel was always the church. That's not true. It was only a type and a shadow. It was only a national uh, a national people that were in one part and one. But it wasn't salvation in the same way that we have it. So we can say it this way. The church is Israel, but Israel is not the church. National Israel is not the church, but the church is the fulfillment of the type and shadow, which was the Old Testament Israel. So we need to understand that both dispensationalism and covenant theology are both wrong and right. There is a continuation from the Old Testament to the New, and there is also a discontinuation because the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ, but this is a different thing. This is a different covenant. It's totally different. It's a reconstituted Israel. When Israel was originally constituted, they were constituted according to a bloodline and according to the law of Moses. If you were in the people and you kept the law of Moses, or even if you were outside the people and you came and you were circumcised and came into the people and kept the law of Moses, you would be part of Israel. Now it is no longer through law. It is no longer through lineage, but we are counted as the Israel of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the seed. We trust in him. We don't go back and obey the Old Testament law of Moses. No, we follow the law of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's not through natural lineage, but it's through spiritual lineage, trusting in Jesus Christ and receiving his spirit. That's why it says, if you are Christ, then you are, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, one more thing, let me throw in real quick before we, we jump out here, is that, is that we see that in the Old Testament, somebody was saved through trusting in God. When they placed their trust in God, they were justified. As Abraham was justified when he believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. But they were sanctified through the law of Moses. It was the law of Moses that was given to them and told them, do this and walk according to this. This will be your wisdom in the sight of the nations. This will be your righteousness if you do these laws. Of course, they couldn't keep it fully because they were flesh. They were without the spirit. And so they would see the law, say that it's good, but they would continue to fail. 
So the Old Testament salvation being justified is the same as in the New. But the difference is in the New Covenant, we're not only justified through faith, and we're not only uh, saved by grace and reconciled to God through grace, but we're also sanctified by grace and that the spirit of God comes to dwell in us and we receive a new heart and a new spirit and the law of God is written in our heart so that we can live according to the law of Christ, which is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, one more thing. I know it's gone quite long, but we'll go ahead and jump into it. If we turn over to Matthew chapter 8, this is very important to understand because you think, well, maybe this is just Paul, you know, getting confused or maybe, you know, Chris is just confused about what Paul is saying. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8 because this was, though those in the Mid-Acts Dispensationalist group will say, oh, Paul said something different than, than Jesus and the apostles and, and, and Jesus and the apostles never talked about uh, the Gentiles, you know, no, that's not true. Uh, the, the Gospels tell us much that salvation is going to be for the Gentiles. Let's read it here uh, in chapter 8, Matthew 8, verse uh, 10. When Jesus heard it, speaking to a uh, about a centurion, uh, sol uh, centurion uh, soldier, he was amazed and said to those who followed, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, that's the natural Jews who reject Messiah, but the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus was already speaking about the fact that Israel was going to be reconstituted around faith. This man had great faith, and so he would be part of the Israel of God. But those uh, Jewish men and the Pharisees, that they had the law of Moses, they had the lineage, they said, we are children of Abraham, and Jesus said, no, you're children of the devil in John chapter 8, because they rejected Messiah, so they were cut off, and they were no longer part of the Israel of God. But we also see it if we go over to, Matthew has a lot to say about this, Jesus in Matthew, I should say. If we turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 21, we read the parable the parable of the vineyard and vine dressers that God, the, the, vineyard, the parable means this. God continually sent prophets to the people of Israel. They continue to reject. Finally, he sent his son and they still rejected him. What will be the result of that? Verse 40, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the vine dressers? Jesus asked the Pharisees. They said he will severely destroy those wicked men and rent his vineyard to other vine dressers and who will give him the fruits in their season. So he says he's going to get... This is their answer. They know what the parable means. Verse 42, but Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is the cornerstone. God's people are determined by how they relate with Jesus Christ, not by their lineage and not by the, how they relate with the law of Moses, but how they relate with Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone Israel has been reconstituted around Jesus Christ. That's how we become part of Israel. That's how we receive the new covenant. We come into the promises given to Israel because we become the children of Abraham. Verse 43, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will crush him. So Jesus was telling the Jews of his day, if they did not receive him, then they would be rejected. But anybody that would receive him would be brought into the promises of Israel, including the promises of the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, that he would give us a new spirit, right, of his law on our heart, and that we would know the Lord. And eternal life is to know the one true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless. Yes, I know that it was absolutely helpful to me just have you on and I thank you all for listening and I hope like brother Christopher Chapman said that this entire explanation was a help for you to be able to understand the fallacy that is being taught by so many big name mainstream dispensationalist pastors that claim that they aren't dispensational when the truth is they really are. For Kingdom Productions Network, I am Pastor Jeremy Anderson, a.k.a. The Remnant Warrior, saying until next time, 
God bless each and every one of you. Grace and peace. Okay, my brothers and sisters, I hope that you were edified from that and that it blessed you. Before we end, and I know that my green screen is all messed up and I apologize for that. There ain't much I can do about it right now. But before we end, I just wanted to show one thing, and that is what the early church had to say about this. We read plenty of scripture, but there's some more here that I want to read. It's not much, I promise. But the more scripture, the better, right? All right, starting with the Old Testament. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And that's Micah 4, 1 and 2. Then we have, From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name will be great among the Gentiles, saith the Lord. Malachi 1.11 Do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham from these stones. And that was Jesus, Matthew 3, nine. In Matthew 8.11, Jesus says this, same thing Chris read. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 8.11 I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Matthew 21.43 For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Romans 2.28-29 they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Romans 9, 6, and 7. There is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 28. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Galatians 6, 15 and 16. So for anyone who says that the Antinicene church, the late first, early second century church, didn't have the scriptures, these are their scriptures. These are Bible verses that they used for the writings I'm about to read. Barnabas, who we know was one of the contemporaries of the Apostle Paul. He's literally in the New Testament. He says around 70 CE, which is the time around the time that the temple was destroyed, let us see if these people, the Christians, are the heirs, or if it is the former, the Jews. Let us see if the covenant belongs to us or them, Barnabas. When he said, Rejoice, you barren one, who bears not, he referred to us, the Gentiles. For our church was barren before children were given unto her. And when he said, For she that is desolate has many more children than she that has a husband, he meant that our people seem to be outcasts from God. But now, through believing and faith, have become more numerous than those who are considered to possess God. And that was from Second Clement. It was said by the same Isaiah that the Gentile nations who were not looking for him would be the ones who would worship him. That's Justin Martyr. Christians from among the Gentiles are both more numerous and more true than those from among the Jews and Samaritans. Justin Martyr again. 
For the true spiritual Israel and the descendants of Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, who in uncircumcision were approved of and blessed by God on account of his faith and called the father of many nations, are we who have been led to God through this crucified Christ Jesus. Justin Martyr again. It had been foretold that the Gentiles would repent of the evil in which they had led erring lives. This would happen when they heard the doctrine preached by his apostles from Jerusalem and when they learned from them. Let me demonstrate this to you by quoting a short statement from the prophecy of Micah. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord will be manifest and many nations will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and they will enlighten us in his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, from Justin Martyr. Along with Abraham, we will inherit the Holy Land when we will receive the inheritance for an endless eternity, being children of Abraham through a similar fate that Abraham had. Justin Martyr. God blesses this people, i.e. the Christians, and calls them Israel and declares them to be his inheritance. So why is it that you, the Jews of the flesh, do not repent of the deception that you are under and evil that you practice upon yourselves, as if you alone were the only Israel? Justin Martyr. All who through him have fled for refuge to the Father, constitute the blessed Israel. But you, the Jews, have understood none of this, and you are not prepared to understand. Rather, since you are the children of Jacob after the flesh, you expect that you will be assuredly saved because of this. Justin Martyr. By these words he declares that we, the nations rejoice with his people, for his people are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets. And in short, all people are well-pleasing to God. Justin Martyr. There are many, many, many from Justin Martyr, but I'm going to read one from Irenaeus. Actually, I'm going to read two from Irenaeus, and then I'm going to stop. God introduces Abraham to the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ. He also introduces Abraham's seed, that is, the church. For upon it conferred the adoption and the inheritance that was promised unto Abraham. The elder nation rejected Christ, saying, We have no king but Caesar. But in Christ every blessing is summed up, and therefore the latter people have snatched away the blessings of the former from the father, just as Jacob took away the blessing of Esau. For this reason, Jacob suffered the plots and persecutions of a brother, just as, oh man, just as the church suffers the same thing from the Jews. Irenaeus. You would think Irenaeus was living now. All right. That is early second century late first century thoughts on what Paul wrote and what the prophets in the Old Testament had to say and what Jesus said. And if you were listening to any dispensationalist, and I'm not referring simply to Pastor Joe Schimmel, as you all should know by now, I respect Pastor Joe Schimmel quite a bit. I consider him my brother. I do not think that just because he is mistaken about this, that he is somehow not saved or that it is going to nullify all the wonderful things that he has done for the kingdom. And I apologize if in the beginning I made some snarky comments about him acting like he was a prophet when he was saying how he had been saying for a long time that Iran was behind this. I know that I was snarky and I probably got into my flesh and I apologize for that. And I want to thank you, my brother, Jason, for calling me out on it. Um, I did take what he said out of context and there's no excuse for that. 
But that being said, the same goes for the things that he is teaching. There is no excuse for saying that anyone who disagrees with the teaching that there is somehow a special blessing that God has in the end times, the dispensational end times, for physical Israel. And anyone who doesn't believe that are replacement theology believers is just ludicrous. I mean, do these people honestly believe that they knew better than the apostles or our Lord? Do they think they knew better than the men who were taught by the apostles that I just read from? I mean, they all quoted scripture before they wrote anything down. Before I read their quotes, I read the scriptures that they used to write those quotes. The early church, I, I would honestly suggest you all go to scrollpublishing.com and get you a dictionary of early Christian beliefs. If you don't have uh, if you don't have access to the Anti-Nicene Fathers, there are nine or ten volumes, so it's like as big as a set of encyclopedias. Um, you know, as big as this book is, it's about the size of one volume of the Anti-Nicene Fathers. However, it has got a reference guide to more than 700 topics that were discussed by the early church fathers. Now, it says early church fathers, but the Anti-Nicene Fathers would not have considered themselves church fathers in any way. They only considered the apostles to be the church fathers. Now, I'm going to end with this. The scriptures are very, very clear, and if you read them in context, they're very easy to discern. I would honestly suggest that everyone who can hear the sound of my voice, re-watch this video because I'm going to be taking down the live stream and uploading the video after I edit it. And I ask that you forgive me for the live stream not being as eloquent as some people's live streams, but I'm not used to live streaming. I haven't live streamed this podcast in two years, and so I'm out of practice. I'm used to recording and editing. But I thought that this was an important enough subject that it needed to be discussed. And when you, you know, I have no problem. It is not a, an issue to divide over. If someone wants to believe dispensational beliefs, it's lies and it's false teaching. But if you want to trust man over just what the word of God says and you want to interpret figurative passages that are obviously figurative, literally, then that's on you. But my problem comes in when you go and call your brothers in Christ heretics while uplifting a group of people who do not worship the same God as you, as a matter of fact, the mo I did not play even <laughs> a fourth of the video from Pastor Schimmel. I am going to put it in the description, and I suggest you go watch it. He talks more about Islam than he does anything else, and how the Antichrist is going to be Islam, and Islam, Islam, Islam. He alludes to plenty of scriptures and he does read one or two from revelation but he reads those out of context i'm not trying to bash on the man i'm just being honest now i would recommend you go watch this and then think about this he keeps bringing up islam 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 first of all islam was never thought to be a part of end times prophecy until joel richardson that's not even like <laughs> john darby recent that's like <laughs> the past 20 or 30 years recent. Nobody ever thought the Antichrist was going to be Islamic until Joel Richardson. There's absolutely no way that Antichrist, which means another Christ, another Messiah, which Jesus said, 
I come in my Father's name, and you reject me. Another will come in his own name, him you will accept. So another Messiah will come that the Jews will accept. He's not going to be Islamic? How would the Jews ever accept a Muslim? I mean, I'm not even going there right now. But I, I do want to say this. The Muslims that he bashes throughout this thing, they revere Jesus Christ more than the people that he's uplifting throughout the whole video. The whole video is just a pro-Judaism video. And I'm not talking about a bloodline. I'm talking about a religion. Because that's what Judaism is. It's, it's not a people. It's a religion. And he talks about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism. He doesn't even know what anti-Semitism is. Anti-Semitism is not a form of racism. There's no such thing as a Semitic race. A, there's Semitic languages, and there are people who use Semitic languages, but to be anti-Semitic would be to it would mean to that you are someone who's anti a certain language. There are many people from the Middle East who use Semitic languages, but all you have to do is research where the word Semitic comes from, what it means. It's talking and mean it's talking about and means a language group. It's not a race of people. You're not, I mean, if you want to call people racist, then just be a man and call them racist. But anti-Semitic makes no sense. However, while he's uplifting the Kabbalah practicing uh, wizards and Zionists, he never once mentions the largest group of believers in the entire underground church that includes China, Iran, or any Muslim or communist country in the world that is in Palestine. The Palestinian underground church, the Christians in Palestine, are not only the largest underground church, but they are the most faithful. They are the closest to the anti-Nicene fathers that I was just reading from. And wouldn't you know it, they live very close to the anti-Nicene fathers as well. And a lot of them have been there for generations. They're generational families. So you say what you want to. You can call 1948, which started way before 1948. It started when the leader of the Third Reich sent the Zionists to the Middle East before the start of the war. I doubt very many of you even know that. You know, he hated a certain ethnic group so bad that he killed millions of them. But before he killed anybody, he sent the Zionist leaders to the Middle East. And he did it under the orders of the ones financing the war. Who do you think financed the war? The same people that have financed both sides of every war that has been fought since the Revolutionary War, at least. And that is the banking clans like the Rothschilds. And in this particular instance, it is the Rothschilds. Now, I'm not saying that this particular uh, dictator didn't hate Jews. He did. And he killed Jews. And it was horrible. Horrible things happened. Horrible things happened on 9-11 too, but it wasn't Muslim terrorists who did it. And I think we can all agree about, well, all of us with a brain can agree on that anyway. Now, I guess I'm going to go ahead and close out and I will add some things to the video whenever I upload it. And it will be a lot more professional. It won't be like the live stream, you know, even when I was live streaming. Frequently, my live streams were a little chaotic. In any case, thank you all for watching. God bless each and every one of you. I love all of you sincerely. And until next time, for the Remnant Report and Kingdom Productions Network, I am the Remnant Warrior saying good night, grace, and peace.